Hey class, welcome to lecture 22 for Johannine writings. Just to give you a little bit of review, we ended on the last lecture with Jesus being arrested willingly and Peter trying to defend him and in effect accidentally cutting off the ear of a servant named Malchus. Now as I mentioned in lecture 22, that's an important detail that I want you to remember. So go ahead and hold on to that because we're going to come back and discuss that in a little bit. But until not until then, Go ahead and get your Bibles out, open them to John chapter 18 so you can read along with me, and then get your notes out ready to fill in those blanks and take as much notes as you can. So let's go ahead and pick right back up where we left off, number two, and Jesus is placed on trial before Annas. So go ahead and make sure you have your Bibles open and read with me when I get to John chapter 18. I'm going to read verses 2 and 3. Verse 2. Then the company of soldiers, the commander and the Jewish officials, arrested Jesus and tied him up. First they led him to Annas, since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now, this is the first of three Jewish trials. John records the first and second one, and you can find that third one in the book of Matthew. That's in front of the Sanhedrin. So Annas, he was only the father-in-law of the high priest Caiaphas, but he was apparently and still in some kind of authority because they bring him to Annas first, which is completely odd and illegal. Now, I gave you a little sheet at the end of these uh, John notes that tells you about the illegality of the trial of Jesus. So if you ever get a chance, just go look at that, and you will find um, Elmer Towns is the one who put it together. He gives a number of illegalities with Jesus' trial. Well, this is one of them. Annas no longer has authority in any way to judge anyone. He is not the high priest anymore. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, is. He is just related to him. And of course, this should get you a little frustrated because nepotism, um, if you don't know what nepotism is, nepotism is when someone gets a position or a job or promotion because of who they're related to. That is something that we all despise. Well, unless it's us, then we like it. But it's still not fair even when it's us. So this is exercising nepotism by allowing Annas to even start the trial. So let's move on to number three. Jesus is denied by Peter once. Now, the only two disciples that are recorded as following Jesus to his first trial were Peter and John. Now, of course, John isn't directly identified, but we're so used to that by the way he talks here. Let's start off, start off by looking at verses 15 and 16. Verse 15 says, Simon Peter was following Jesus, as was another disciple. That disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest, so he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. Now, I know I'm supposed to read 16 but 15. Look at that. John was known by the high priest, so he actually goes in with them, which is incredible. But let's look at what Peter does. Verse 16. But Peter remained standing outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the girl who was with the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Now, that's important. We're going to come back to that. So even though they are both following Jesus, only one of them displayed true courage and commitment to Christ. And despite the fact that the very son-in-law of the first judge over Jesus' trial knew who John was, he still accompanied Jesus in the room while Peter did what? Now, he just waited outside. Now, let's look at verse 17 and 18. Remember, John goes and gets Peter by way of the messenger of the, the girl who kept the door. So verse 17. Then the servant girl who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, You aren't one of the, this man's disciples too, are you? I am not, he said. Now the servants and the officials had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing there warming themselves, and Peter was standing with them warming himself. So John goes and gets this little servant girl, this little girl, to go get him. Go get Peter. And when she goes, as Peter asks her, are you one of the disciples too? Oh, no, no, not me, not me. And then he goes and warms himself by the fire with the company of the very men who had Jesus arrested. So, I mean, that right there is just dumbfounded. Can you imagine how John felt when he's probably watching this interaction? He's like, oh, my goodness. Peter is not coming. What is going on? Which kind of maybe shows a little bit of why in John's gospel account, we see Peter thrown under the bus a few times for what he does. Because John's like, well, you should have followed Jesus. All right, so number four, 
Jesus is interrogated by Caiaphas. Now, this is a second Jewish trial, still illegal, and this one is done before Caiaphas Joseph. He, was, he served as a high priest from A.D. 18 to A.D. 36, so from 18 to 36. Now, according to Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, he said that Caiaphas Joseph had a reputation for intrigue, bribery, and the love of money. That word intrigue there was Joseph's way of saying, or Josephus' way of saying he liked to do a lot of immoral things. So intrigue, bribery, and the love of money. So let's see the two things that happen here. Letter A, Jesus invokes the need for witnesses in a trial. Verses 19 through 20, let's look at those. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus said in verse 20, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple. Where? All the Jews gather, and I haven't spoken anything in secret. Verse 21, why do you question me? Question those who heard what I told them. Look, they know what I said. So Caiaphas is asking Jesus, tell us about what you said. And he says, I've never said anything in secret, guys. I go to the synagogue and the temple all the time and teach. If you want to know what I've said, call in some witnesses. Well, he is right. In any court of law, you have to have witnesses. And according to Deuteronomy 18... There had to be two or three witnesses in order for this trial to even continue. There are none, but it's still going to continue. Then letter B, Jesus challenges the officers' actions. Let's look at verse 22 and what the officers of the court do. When he had said these things, one of the officials standing by slapped Jesus, saying, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Now, Jesus had made a true statement about needing witnesses, and that officer was so appalled that he would talk to the high priest that way, he slaps him in the face, which is terrible. Then verse 23, Jesus said, If I have spoken wrongly, give evidence about the wrong. But if rightly, why do you hit me? So Jesus even calls out that guard, that that officer. He says, If I've done something wrong, fine, show me the evidence. But if I haven't done anything wrong, why did you just hit me? Think about the outrage we would rightfully have if you saw a police officer go and hit a person for doing nothing wrong. I hope that would make your blood boil and you would want justice for that individual. That is what we're going through right here. And in fact, if that would have happened in a court of law, him being physically assaulted like that by the, the officer and the high priest should have caused the entire thing to be debunked and for him to be let go. But of course, that's not going to happen. Now let's move on to letter B. Jesus is denied by Peter twice more, or two times. Yeah, that's so weird, twice more. So we're going to pick back up this narrative with Peter warming himself with the officers who arrested Jesus. And John records these two, two of these other denials here in verses 25 through 27. So let's look at that. Verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. Remember, a little girl asked him first time. You know, I don't know why he was afraid to admit, admit it to her. Maybe she was gonna she was gonna bite his ankles or something. I don't know. And then he this second time it's to those people who arrested Jesus. He's a little more intimidated now. He's oh I'm not. Then look at verse 26. This is very important. I told you we'd come back to this. One of the high priest servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Peter denied it again, and immediately the rooster crowed. Now, the second time he denies it pertained to his position as a disciple. The third time here, it's actually to a relative of Malchus. Now, you want to give him a little bit, I mean, it's still wrong. Please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. But it's almost a little bit of, uh, you kind of have a little bit of feeling for him, empathy, when he's, he did, maybe he didn't know, maybe John was the only one that knew and he tells us later, or maybe Peter told John, and that's why he gets recorded this way. But one of the Malchus's relatives says, wait, Weren't you there? Can you imagine he's, if he knew? He's like, oh no, I uh, hurt one of your relatives. This might not go the way I think it should. And immediately after Peter's third and final denial, the rooster crowed. And this reminded him of the prophecy Jesus made of his commitment to him and how he would deny him. Now, it talks about the rooster crowing, and we believe from study that this would have been about 3 a.m., which also lends to the illegality of this whole sham of a trial because you are not allowed to try someone in the middle of the night like this. Now, let's move on to number six. Jesus is placed on trial before Pilate. Before Pilate. Now, just like there were three Jewish trials, 
there are three Roman trials. And for this one, it's really interesting because John only records the first and the third. You can go to Matthew and record the second one. The second one is in front of a man named Herod. Okay, But the first and the third were in front of Pilate. Now, Pilate here, we're going to find out, doesn't have anything to do with this this whole issue. And he's going to try several times to release him. And in fact, I've included a link to a Mike Rowe, The Way I Heard It podcast he did. It's real short, only six minutes. I want you to listen to it. The, typically, if you've ever listened to Mike Rowe's The Way I Heard It, they're my favorite podcast to listen to because he doesn't tell you what it's about until you get to the end. This is I'm actually kind of giving you too much information here, but if you listen to the first time, when you got to the end of his podcast, you every single one I've ever listened to, I'm like, oh my gosh, he did that or she did that or you know this happened here. I'm, I put that I'm going to put that link right underneath this lecture in the weekly lessons here. Now, I want you to just go by. I'm not going to ask you. It's just it's something if you just really want to hear an amazing story about Pilate, go listen to that podcast. And if you want to listen to really some awesome podcasts, go listen to it as well. Okay, so just that's a lot of information about Pilate, but he doesn't want to have anything to do with this. He tries to release Jesus six times, but obviously never to any good avail. Um, so let's pick up in verse 28 now. Verse 28 says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves. Otherwise, they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. Now, this trial transpi- transpired in what they called the Praetorium, which was the judgment hall. And Pilate was there. It was He was the one, the governor, over this land. And Jesus' accusers waited outside for fear of defiling himself, themselves in the home of a Gentile prior to the Passover. That is nowhere listed in the Old Testament that you couldn't do that. That was just something that they thought would make them unclean if they dare went into a Jew's, or excuse me, a Gentile's home before the Passover. And then verses 31 through 33, um, let's look at that real quick. It says, Pilate told him, you take him and judge him according to your law. It's not legal for us to put anyone to death, the Jews declared. They said this, that Jesus' words might be fulfilled, indicating what kind of death he was going to die. Verse 33, then Peter, I'm excuse me, then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, resistant at first to try Jesus, Pilate eventually appeased the Jews' request, which that podcast is going to help you with that, understand why. He, he appeased the Jews' request on account of the penalty that they sought, which was death. So at first, it's like, oh, you guys just take care of yourself. I don't want anything to do with this. And they're like, well, we can't. We're not allowed to put people to death because you are in charge of Rome. So Pilate's like, all right, fine. Come over here to me. And he asked him, are you really the king of the Jews? Now, this would have been an act, could have been an act of war by there being a king because the inscription that Pilate loved the most was the inscription, Hail Caesar. He thought Caesar was supposed to be the number one, the most worshipped. So if he would have, if Jesus would have said, yes, I am, or something like that, then that could have been a way of like treason in Pilate's eyes. Then number seven, Jesus is declared innocent by Pilate and attempts to substitute him for Barabbas. Now, while not recorded in John's gospel account, after that first trial, Jesus is transferred to Herod for that second Roman trial and then returned back to Pilate for this third and final Roman tri- trial. Let's look at verse 38. Verse 38 says, um, where am I at? Sorry. Um, oh, uh, verse 37 and 38. He says, you are a king then, Pilate asks. He, Jesus says, you say that I'm a king. I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this, to testify the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then verse 38, Pilate says, well, what is truth? Now, this is interesting. So there's a brief interrogation by Je- of Jesus by Pilate, and Pilate concludes that Jesus had committed no crime worthy of punishment. So because it looks in verse at the end of verse 38, I forgot to read the rest of it, it says, after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging him. In other words, he's done nothing wrong. Why do I need to keep him? Now, since Pilate's announcement of Jesus as innocent was not enough to appease the Jews, he then determined to appeal to their own traditions. Now, but here's the thing to think about. If a judge declares someone innocent, what's supposed to happen? That's right, the trial's supposed to be over. This should have been the end of it. But the Jews will not let this go. So he says, okay, let me come up with another plan. Verse 38, 39, and 40. You have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover. So, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a revolutionary. Now, this is interesting, okay? Jesus 
is basically being offered as a way Pilate is thinking, surely they're going to take Jesus over Barabbas. But they wanted Barabbas because even though he's basically, we believe, because he was a murderer and a thief and all that, he was still on the side of the Jews because he was a revolutionary trying to go against Rome. So they want him. And they definitely don't want Jesus to be um, released. I mean, this is just astounding how this whole thing is going, going on. Then letter B, Jesus is beaten and crucified. So let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 19. And start in letter number one. Pilate attempts to appease the Jews. Appease the Jews. How does he do that? Letter A. He had Jesus scourged and mocked. Let's look at verse one. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged or scourged. It's the same thing. Now, Roman history teaches us that the process of flogging or scourging was excruciating to the individual it was sentenced upon. After being tied naked to a post, the individual would be whipped with an un or excuse me, with an instrument known as the cat of nine tails. Sometimes it was a regular whip. Sometimes it was a regular uh, stick. But many times. If they really want to inflict damage, they would use this thing called a cat of nine tails. And a cat of nine tails was a whip that had nine endings full of sharp instruments that were intended to cut, tear, and rip the flesh off of a prisoner. And remember, the individual's naked, and that whip doesn't care what part of the body it touches. Literally, Jesus offered every square inch of his body for us. And although the Jews limited a whipping to 39 times, it is not recorded that the Jews had a limit. So therefore, we have no idea the exact number that Jesus had to endure, even though even one lash would have been horrific and more than he deserved. And then let's look at verses 2 and 3. The soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, clothed him in a purple robe, and they kept saying to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and were slapping his face as a way to be like, yeah, right. So they added the insult to injury by mocking him, putting that purple robe on him, mutilating him with the crown of thorns on his head, and striking him with their hands. These grown men who were soldiers hitting him over and over and over. Then let her be. Pilate again presents Jesus to the people as innocent. Verse 4 and 5. Pilate went outside again and said to them, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here he is the man. This is interesting. Again, he's declared him innocent another time. This was basically the fifth of six times that Pilate has tried to release Jesus, but it will not work because the people don't care. They want him crucified, which is letter C. The Jewish leaders respond by demanding Jesus' crucifixion. Verses 6 and 7. When the chief priests and the temple servants saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate responded, Take him and crucify him yourself, since I find no grounds for charging him. Then verse 7. We have a law, the Jews replied to him, and according to the law, he, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Now, for a Jew, it, or excuse me, for a Gentile, a Greek, a Roman, it didn't matter. They didn't actually care necessarily if you weren't a believer in God. They actually were more cared if you didn't believe in a God at all. That was actually punishable by death according to Roman law. So they, Pilate and the Romans didn't care if he said he was a God. Big wolf. They had all the stories of demigods. That wasn't a big deal to them. And then letter D. Pilate attempts, or excuse me, Pilate attempts to persuade Jesus to defend himself. Look at verse 8. Verse 8, when Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid than ever. Th that's phenomenal, okay? So in spite of the blackmail attempt they try to have against Pilate, Pilate still besought Jesus for some way to keep from having to kill him. So in then verse 10 and 11, let's see here. So Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus said in verse 11, you have no authority over me at all. If it hadn't been given you from above, this is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. So instead of trying to get released, Jesus responded by revealing to Pilate that the true source of power and the, deep, and the deeper bearers of evil, the true source of power was God, and the, tr the deeper bearers of evil in this whole instance were those Jews. Now while this, may, while this appears to be a reprimand, it may have been more of Jesus' way of easing Pilate's conscience by showing him that he had no control over the situation, and, while he still took some guilt in these actions, 
the greater guilt was upon the Jews who brought Jesus to him. And then lastly, letter B, Pilate questions whether or not they truly wanted to crucify their king, which is phenomenal. Which, by the way, how, how many of you have ever wondered if Pilate ever got saved? And I know I have because you just read the story. He's got such a you know a conflicted spirit. There was actually a um, a Christian apologist whose name was Athenagoras who wrote in the 100 A.D.s to Lucas, uh, Commodus Augustus, and Marcus Aurelius. Those are real people. There's a movie made about a gladiator, but it has nothing to do with the true historical facts. But Athenagoras wrote this letter to them. And because he was trying to defend the Christian life because they were killing Christians this time over misinformation. Like one of the misinformation was they thought we were cannibals because we had partook of the Lord's Supper. They didn't understand the symbolism that we were trying to say there, which is ridiculous. And then another was that they said that um, basically misconstrued us to say that we didn't believe in a God. We were atheists, so they wanted to kill us for that. That was not the case as well. They misunderstood that we said, no, there's only one God. But here's the thing that was really interesting. They, Athenagoras writes Lucius Commodus Augustus Marcus Aurelius and says, if Pilate, the one who delivered Jesus over to be crucified, could come, basically come to not the knowledge of him as Savior, so can you. Now, that is not Bible, but I'm going to tell you right now, that's the closest to the real life events that you and I have, is that a person who lived only, who lived less than 100 years after Pilate, believed, and so did the church of Christians of his time, believe that Pilate eventually did become a believer, and I cannot wait to one day see him in heaven. That's going to be really cool. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this. Verse 14. Verse 14 says, It was the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Then he told the Jews, here is your king. So it's about noon, okay? So this, you know, the, the uh, Jews would have been the sixth hour. This is about noon when Jesus comes across and said, look, here's your king. In the verse 15, they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to him, should I crucify your king? Or listen to this. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest said. When you listen to that podcast, you're going to be dumbfounded how they've changed their perspective on their view of Caesar on this because they want to manipulate in any way they can to see Jesus dead. And then verse 16, verse 16 says, Then he handed him over to be crucified. That was the sixth and final time Pilate tried to release Jesus. And with all of his efforts exhausted, he turned Jesus over to the Jews to accomplish their evil deed. Well, that's the end of Lecture 22. Hope you've had a good week, and I don't know if it's Good Friday that before or after when you're listening to this, but I hope you've had a, a good Friday remembering the day that Jesus died, and I hope your Easter will be uh, memorable of Christ and what He's done for us, even though we can't meet together collectively. Um, that's the beauty of the body of Christ. We're all still interconnected with the Holy Spirit. Um, love you all. Miss you. Hopefully I see you soon.